Hi, I'm Prof L and welcome to Chemistry Matters. And today we are going to do a couple of problems which involve figuring out the chemical formulae of unknown compounds. Now, you've probably sat in uh, class or in lectures and your teacher has written stuff up on the board saying the chemical formula of, oh, I don't know, what, aluminium sulfate is uh, Al2SO43, or the chemical formula of um, calcium chloride is CaCl2. How do we know that? How do we actually know these chemical formulae? Well, the answer to that question is that we carry out analyses of these particular compounds. Generally what we do uh, in the case of organic compounds is that we burn them. We burn them in an atmosphere of oxygen and then what we do is we measure the amount of, for example, carbon dioxide and water that come out. And then doing some stoichiometry we can figure out uh, the amount of carbon that had to be in our starting compound, the amount of hydrogen that was in our starting compound, etc, etc, and from that we can get a chemical formula. So today, as I said, we're going to do a couple of problems based on this sort of idea. And so what we're going to be doing in the first problem is calculating an empirical formula of uh, an organic compound, sometimes called simplest formulae as well, for reasons that we will see. So we're going to have a look at a compound called propofol. It's not a chemical name, it's a trade name. This is a sedative, um, so it's used to calm you down when you're sort of having sort of, uh, let's say, internal operations, things like that sort of stuff. So you'll find this in medicine. And we want to know what the empirical formula of this particular compound is. So, as I said, what people very probably did was to take this, combust it in an atmosphere of oxygen, and from that, they found that propofol is made up of 80.8 .8 mass percent of carbon and 10.2 mass percent of hydrogen and the remainder was oxygen. That was 9 mass percent. Now, from these results, we can figure out what the chemical formula of propofol is. So, how do we go about doing that? Well, again, we use stoichiometric principles uh, in our calculations to find out the empirical formula now of propofol. So what are these data telling us? This is telling us that 80.8% of the mass of any sample of propofol is carbon, and 10.2% of the mass of any sample of propofol is hydrogen, and ditto 9% of the mass of any sample of propofol is oxygen. What we're going to do is to say, okay, let's imagine that we had, just, just for argument's sake, we had a 100 gram sample of propofol, for argument's sake. So, what would that 100 gram sample be made up of? It would be made up of 80.8 grams of carbon, wouldn't it? Because we're saying that carbon is, makes up 80.8% of the mass. So if we have a 100 gram sample, we're going to have 80.8 grams of carbon. In that 100 gram sample, we'd also have 10.2 grams of hydrogen, and we'd also have 9.0 grams of oxygen. Now, why did we do that? Well, because as you're hopefully aware with sort of stoichiometric problems, if you're given a mass, you can get a number of moles. You can get an amount, can't you? Provided you know a molar mass. And we know the molar mass of all of these. This is just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So, if these are the masses in a 100 gram sample, let's work out now the number of moles of each of these in a 100 gram sample. So, number of moles of carbon in that 100 gram sample is going to be 80.8 .8 grams over 12.01 grams per mole. Um, in terms of hydrogen, the number of moles of hydrogen is going to be 10.2 grams over 1.008 grams per mole. And in terms of oxygen, the number of moles of oxygen is going to be 9.0 grams over 16.00 grams per mole. Just like that. What then 
do these numbers come out as when we calculate these? So we are going to get in terms of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. This calculation comes out as 6.728 mole. Uh, the hydrogen is going to come out at 10.12 mole. And the oxygen is going to come out at 0 0.5625 mole. Okay. Has that really helped us? Um, well, the answer is yes, it actually has. Because what we've done, essentially, is that we've gone from a ratio by mass to a ratio by moles. And that's important if we're going to be calculating uh, a chemical formula, because a chemical formula is quite simply a ratio by moles or a ratio by amount. How do we then convert this ratio of 6.7 to 10.1 to 0.56 to something uh, a, that makes a little bit more sense? Well, what we then do is that we divide through each of these numbers by the smallest number. And that, hopefully, is going to give us nice whole number ratios, because that's what we get in chemical formula. We get nice whole number ratios. H2O, NH3, C2, H5, OH, these sorts of things. So let's divide each of these by the smallest number. So uh, oxygen is going to be the easy one, because that is going to be 0 0.5625 over 0 0.5625, and that's going to equal, obviously, 1. Hydrogen is going to be 10.12 over 0 0.5625, and that is going to come out at 18. And carbon is going to be 6.728 over 0 0.5625, and that is going to come out at 12. So what have we done here? We've got now our mole ratio for propofol in terms of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Here's the ratio. 12 carbons, 18 hydrogens, 1 oxygen. And there's your empirical formula right there. Your empirical formula then becomes C12H18O. Is that the actual formula of propofol? And the answer is yes, it is. And for those of you who are interested, the chemical structure of propofol looks like this. And it has got the chemical name 2,6-diisopropyl uh, phenol. What this particular treatment does is it tells us the empirical formula, the simplest formula which is C12H18O. Now, we can't tell what the actual formula is by doing this because what would happen if the actual formula was, let's say, C24H36O2? The ratio would still be the same, but the chemical formula, the molecular formula, would be different. Okay, So we need another piece of information in order to be able to say with certainty what the molecular formula is. But this treatment, this whole empirical formula treatment, tells you the smallest possible ratio of elements within a compound, OK? That's a nice little way of doing things. Again, we're simply taking masses. We're turning masses into amounts. We're looking at the ratio of amounts. And bam, there is your empirical formula. So let's have a look at another uh, type of uh, problem here. <clears throat> we have got a compound which contains only copper and sulfur. That's it, okay? We want to know its empirical formula. How do we go about doing that? Well, again, we take this compound, whose formula we don't know, and we combust it in oxygen. And when we analyze what happens, we find that if we take 5.26 grams of this compound, we then get 2.12 grams of SO2 when we burn the whole thing in oxygen. So what's the empirical formula of our compound given these particular data here? We've got a mass 
of something whose formula we don't know. So that's kind of useless to us in this case. Masses are normally really useful, but you need to know a molar mass. We don't. That's the whole question, essentially. But we're given a mass of something here whose chemical formula we do know. So we can calculate now a number of moles of SO2, can't we? Because we've got a mass and we can figure out what the molar mass is. So we're going to be using, again, our old favorite equation. So mass over amount, so therefore, is equal to mass over molar mass in this case. Okay. And so therefore, we are going to have uh, 2.12 grams of SO2. And we're going to be dividing that by the molar mass of SO2, which is 32.06 plus 2 times 16 gram per mole. And when we do that calculation, we then get 3.31 times 10 to the minus 2 mole. What we're saying is that when we take our unknown compound and we burn it in oxygen, we end up with 3.31 by 10 to the minus 2 moles of SO2. Knowing that, can we get the number of moles of sulfur in this particular sample of our compound? And the answer is yes, we can. How many moles of sulfur are there in one mole of SO2? And the answer is one. So in other words, if we know the number of moles of SO2, we know the number of moles of sulfur. So therefore, number of moles of sulfur in our compound is equal to 3.31 times 10 to the minus two mole. That's good. <clears throat> now where do we go from here? Well, again, we've got an amount now. We've converted to an amount. If we know an amount, we can get a mass, can't we, if we know a molar mass? And we certainly know the molar mass of sulfur. And so therefore, the mass of sulfur in this compound here, in our 5.26 grams, is going to be equal to the number of moles multiplied by the molar mass, which is 3.31 times 10 to the minus 2 mole times 32.06 grams per mole. And what you then get from that is, let's go back up here, the mass of sulfur is equal to 1.06 grams when you do that calculation. Okay, and we're nearly there now because we know our starting mass was 5.26 grams. And that starting mass was made up solely of copper and sulfur. And through this analysis, we've shown that of that 5.26 grams, 1.06 grams of it was sulfur. So we can then get the mass of copper, can't we? Because that must be equal to the difference between the two. 5.26 minus 1.06 grams and that equals 4.20 grams of copper. We're laughing now. <clears throat> We're pretty much there. So, what we have now is essentially a straight empirical formula calculation type question. We've got a mass of sulfur. We've got a mass of copper. We can work out numbers of moles of both of those things now, can't we? Okay, and that's going to lead now to our uh, empirical formula. To get uh, numbers of moles, we divide by the molar mass. So the number of moles of sulfur is 1.06 over 32.06 gram per mole. And that is equal to 0 0.0330. And the number of moles of copper is equal to 4.20 grams over 63.55 grams per mole, and that equals 0 0.0661. That's looking good, okay? That, that looks like a nice sort of very close to whole number ratio there, doesn't it? So 
Again, as we did for the previous example, we divide through by the smallest. We divide these two numbers through by the smallest. So the ratio of sulfur to copper, here's the smallest number, 0 0.0330 over 0 0.0330 to uh, 0 0.0661 over 0 0.0330. That equals 1. That equals 2. And so therefore, our empirical formula is going to be Cu2S, okay? Copper 1 sulfide, in other words, if you're interested in its chemical name. Okay, so that second one was a little bit more involved than the first problem, um, but once we'd done sort of the preparatory work, it came down to a straight empirical formula type problem where you go through uh, the list of um, steps, basically, and so therefore, you get your ratio by mass, you divide through by the molar mass to get your ratio by moles, then you divide through by the smallest, that gives you your whole number ratios, and everything falls out very, very nicely. So there you go, that's all you need to know about empirical formulae. We'll see you next time.